Dom. Hello. <laughs> How are you, John? I'm good. I'm good. So you're across right now in America land. Yep. So, uh, Dom, for people that don't know who you are, uh, what, what do you do at Cubicle 7 then, Dom? I am the director of role-playing game development, uh, production, and the creative studio. Well, very good. And uh, so, and what did you do on The One Ring? Uh, I was the editor. Um, I was uh, helped with that with, uh, by uh, David Waugh. Um, so really what we were doing with that was uh, taking Francesco's manuscripts and um, writing them um, or, or editing them so that they came across more as um, English from a, a first language English speaker. Um, I also wrote some small parts and um, I, I think that the, on a broader sense uh, we were um, involved from the uh, from a very early stage just in a kind of a consultancy role um, talking through with Francesco the way things were going and uh, testing out mechanics and f giving him feedback on those and uh, yeah, just, just acting as a, as a partner really for, um, for the development of the game. Um, we've uh, I, uh, we also ran the the play tests that were uh, that went on, so uh, that was uh, that was part of uh, of ours. Then um, moving into the the, one, the production side of the game, so um, I was uh, taking lead on the the art direction um, again with Francesco um, going through what what we wanted to see in there and uh, giving the briefs to the uh, to the artists, um, ably assisted by John Hodgson. <laughs> <laughs> Who's he? I've heard he's a bit of an idiot. Um, then on the physical production of the game, um, I uh, spec'd up the what the, what the slipcase was going to be looking like and uh, worked with uh, Robert from Sophisticated Games on um, translating that into to print to speak and uh, uh, getting the demos, uh, demo copies and uh, making sure that they all looked alright, deciding what the maps should look like and what the books, um, yeah, well, the, the physical qualities of the books. And then I was finally sitting nervously and waiting for books to make it onto aeroplanes and uh, transport ships and <laughs> containers and all the rest of the year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There, there are any number of things that can go wrong with that, aren't there? There really are. <laughs> there are yes. <laughs> there is much excitement online as we're recording this. This is the day before it goes on sale at Gen Con and everyone is eagerly awaiting there. Yeah, yes. pre-order copies and so on, and of course it's all, you know, it's it's all <laughs> <laughs> a wing and a prayer at the moment. Everything is in the right place, isn't it? But, uh, obviously, you've done, yeah. you've done everything you can do. But uh, yeah, absolutely, you just have to wait. So no, I was um, I was delighted today to finally uh, get the the palette of uh, the, the, the first palette of One Ring um, to the Gen Con stand. <laughs> is there? It is you can confirm it is at Gen Con. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. Francesco hugged the palette. <laughs> <What's it? laughs> Did you have to prize him off it? <laughs> Brilliant yeah. stuff. No, it's great. Oh, it's good to hear. It's there. It's yes. real. It's not just an empty box. No, no. It's um, it's definitely there. It's it's a, it's a really nice package. I'm really pleased with the way it's come together. Uh, it's always a real uh, moment of trepidation when um, when it went something um, like that. Uh, you've spec'd up, and um, you, you've kind of over, overseen the, the, the production process of it and the, the physical production. It's terrifying when that FedEx package arrives with your first copy or two. Um, it's, you, know, it's, you, you, you obviously you're, you're just delighted and so excited to see it and open it and finally you know have a look, uh, but also terrified in case it's a complete mess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in case none of it fits together. Is that the printer actually thought that you meant for the pages to be sewn inside the top lid of the box? So. <laughs> 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 it's anything quite that bad. But, uh, yeah, no, it's. Uh, but we see think, things like seeing the dice when they arrive. Oh, yeah, they're great. Um, yeah, it's it's a big moment of relief as well as like the excitement of seeing it. Um, yeah, certainly the, the Doctor Who box, my my first sort of complicated project. That was definitely yeah, yeah, it's definitely one of those moments. Heart in mouth. <laughs> <laughs> I don't suppose you'll ever get used to that, really, will you? Because it's no, definitely you just never know, do you? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that. definitely. Especially the small company when you know you just um, you you just spent all that money. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, that could be quite scary. Yeah, I can well imagine. Yeah, very good.
So you've been you've been playing the game a lot, haven't you? I mean, you've been involved in playtesting, obviously. Yeah. And I know you have a you have a regular group, don't you, playing the game? Yes, yes, we had a regular group in Swindon. Um, it's yeah gone down really well with them um, from the, the the earliest of iterations, really. Um, the game, I think, yeah, the, the game's developed certainly, but it's uh, I'd say one of one of the, the 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 real strengths of the game for me is uh, Francesco's vision is fantastic for it. Um, he's got a really strong idea of exactly what he wanted to achieve and what he wanted to do, and he hasn't let himself get deviated from that. Um, and I think that really really shows it's you know such a consistent, um, well thought through game um, because of that, and that's that's Francesco's vision that's um, that, that's let us deliver that. Mm. Cool, very good. So, are you are you a lore master in the game, or do you have a character? And if you've got a character, what's your character? Tell me about your character, Dom. <laughs> <laughs> that gets out of that question easily, doesn't it? Lore master, my question is, my character is all powerful, <laughs> quite omniscient, and. Uh... So, what what characters have you got in the game? Can you remember off the top of your head? Um, yes, I can. I probably won't be able to remember the names. Sure. <laughs> but uh, we've had uh, our woodman, um, whose uh, faithful hound has been um, the downfall of uh, many foul servants of the shadow. Uh, we have a dwarf who was we have a dwarf exile um, who was uh, told to uh, go forth. Uh, his, his clan elders told him to go out, or family uh, head. Um, told him to go out on a mission um, amongst the free peoples and to not rush back. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so we had the surly dwarf exile. Um, we had an elf, a uh, Mirkwood elf, uh, who was um, quite a sort of a know-it-all member of the party. That, that was quite entertaining. And then we had the uh, the disappearing hobbit. Um, who was so good at disappearing that we didn't actually see them at uh, <laughs> seven of the game sessions. <laughs> yeah, we had, a couple, we had a couple of floating characters that came in and out. Sure. I think it's interesting for a, for a role-playing game where you've got um, such levels of distinction um, amongst different cultures of the same race. So rather than having, you know, you've got your humans and your elves and your dwarves, you've got the different cultures of human. I think that, that really brings in um, a distinctive flavour um, Rather than, I think I think sometimes you, you, you run the risk with just sort of like a, a character being drawn from a race, whether it's uh, elf. It can sometimes get a bit bland. Mm. Um, whereas the the focus that we've got, of, you're coming from a culture. I think you've got automatically your character's got a a default um, cultural approach to say to other, to other cultures that you know that they may rebel up against. Um, but you've got that all of that sort of um, stuff in your back automatically really without even trying so you know you know this is who your character is and where they come from things and uh, I think that that's that really helped to get people into character really quickly yeah that's really something that struck me on reading the, the game is a big problem I've had playing Middle-earth games in the past is that it's very hard to, to think up a character that fits Middle-earth that isn't just riffed off mm. one of the characters in the book whereas the game's really yeah. helpful isn't it in in offering all these background options that, that are very um, Talking like you know in their focus, which um, I thought was a, was a great help and a really good a good thing, you know. Um, yeah, definitely. I think it just seemed to be that, that yeah people did get into character very quickly. Um, and I think as well, especially with um, any Middle Earth based property, uh, most people know a little bit or kind of enough to be familiar. Um, but there's a, a big gulf then between the level of detail that the setting provides. And I think sometimes people find that can find that a little bit off-putting. I know, know with Merp, um, with Merp, I found when I was running that that people almost felt like they they didn't know enough to play it properly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, which is probably a testament to the level of detail that the um, the game went into um, in many ways. But um, I mean, what I think that what we try to do with the, with the cultures and the, does does help to get around that because it gives people a very bite-sized chunk of setting they can get their head around and make pro proclamations about where they're from. Because there's there's little sections in there for each each culture has a little view of all the other cultures, you know, a little sort of summation of how they in general feel about the other cultures, which I thought that was really helpful as well. Because yeah. um, mm. then in the game you make characters and you kind of layer up. Um, different aspects of your character don't you so you pick the culture yeah. you're from and then you have different what what else you tell me about that what what other aspects define your character is it is do you roll up some stats and things like that uh you choose a background for your character there's six backgrounds for each of the cultures 
Um, so you um, you choose one of those. You can modify. There's a description that comes with each, which you can use or modify, um, and that that gives yeah just gives a bit more personality to the character from the word go, um, as well as simply just determining sort of you know what their what their main strengths and weaknesses are. Um, it's a good, good sort of narrative um, reason for why your character is the way that they are. Um, then you've got the, the traits, which are a range of um, basically descriptions about what your character's like. Um, and they can, they can be good and bad, or they can have good and bad aspects. You could have... Um, so, yeah, so an example of a trait could be cautious, um, say. And that could give you a slight positive um, edge uh, in a situation where that's a value, where you know if you're exploring somewhere, or if um, you're talking to somebody and you're not sure if you should trust them or not. But then it also has the negative aspect, perhaps, as well, where you don't trust somebody that you should, or um, you're just a bit slow to take advantage of a situation. So, um, yeah, they're, they're nice little descriptions um, that help to round out the character. I noticed a lot of them. A lot of them are named with sort of in-game term, in-character terms that you could almost. I was looking the other day at the the, the pre-generated characters that come in the book in the book, and you could almost read off their traits to describe them in in character. It's not just a kind of you know. It's not a mechanical thing. Yep. No. It's. Um, I think the the, um, the next uh, well, a few steps on, but uh, mm. one of one of the other things that really appeals to me are the callings, uh, mm. which is the, the the reason why your adventurer is out on the road. Um, so they could be a slayer, um, who um, that means basically that you are out to uh, avenge your, your dead family or um, some sort of outrage that's been visited on you by uh, agents of the shadow. Um, or you could be a warden where you're, um, you're, you, you feel that you need to defend your settlement or your land or um, in whatever way that, 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 uh, that comes out. Or uh, maybe a, a treasure hunter who's out to um, either get the loot or um, I suppose more romantically recover the uh, the artifacts of a lost age. Mm. Um, now each of those comes with a um, shadow weakness as well, which is the um, um, your your characters or the, your character's path to corruption. So, say the uh, the treasure hunter has the, the dragon sickness, uh, which is, is basically as greed starts to um, you know, greed greed is their main weakness and. Um, once they start on that path, and they, they they start becoming more um, more acquisitive and um, um, jealous of their possessions and mistrust others, and they want to steal from them all the time. I thought, yeah, I thought that was absolutely brilliant because it's what makes your character sort of good and strong is also their downfall, which I thought is yeah, incredibly, yeah. you know, Middle Earth in in tone. That, you know, like a, a really strong fighting character can, can sort of succumb to sort of pride and, and vengeance and all those kind of things and lust for power, isn't it, is one of them that yes. that you know, you're too strong almost and that's you know, that's the weakness that's used against you, you know. Very good I thought.